Welcome to The Book Podcast, where we discuss books about the book, the Bible, with your hosts, Scott Moffitt, Gabriel Penfield, and Gary Karwaski. We go as deep as we can go, look as hard as we can look, but we only scratch the surface of the meaning of the book. We only scratch the surface of the meaning of the book. Are you confused with all the talk of the covenants in the Bible? Ever wonder exactly what the Mosaic Covenant is? And that is not even to mention others like the Abrahamic, the Davidic, the Noahic, the Adamic Covenant, and the list, of course, goes on. Today, we will try to answer that question as to what the New Covenant is and what does it mean to us today. Greetings. This is our 39th podcast of the book. We certainly appreciate you taking the time to listen to our interviews of Christian authors. And today it's our uh, privilege to, in- to introduce you to and to ask questions of Mike Stallard. Now, if you have not subscribed to our podcast, we would ask that you do so. Subscribe by clicking the subscribe button on the screen and also click the notification bell. Today, Mike Stallard, who is the editor editor of Dispensational Understanding of the New Covenant. That's the book that we're going to be examining today. Is a scholar and an author. And uh, did you pastor, Mike? I assume you you did. I pastored for 31 years. Mm -hmm. So we welcome you. Let me share a few words about his life and background. As he told you, he pastored for 31 years. His academic past includes a BS from Alabama, an MDiv from Liberty, and a PhD from Dallas Seminary. He has served as Dean and Director of PhD Studies at Bible Baptist Seminary. While he has researched and done a lot of work on dispensational premillennialism, ecclesiology, Baptist distinctives and theological me- methods as he served at Calvary University as an adjunct member in Bible and theology. He also served in a similar capacity at Bob Jones and at uh, Friends of Israel, where he is, where he's at currently. A couple of things. The book is written by traditional classic dispensationalists. It's not a complete picture of what all Christendom holds about the New Covenant. This book also presents three different views that traditional dispensationalists have understood the New Covenant. First, that the church has no legal relationship to the New Covenant. Secondly, the church has an indirect relationship to the New Covenant. And finally, thirdly, the church has a direct relationship to the New Covenant. We will discuss these views with Mike who is the editor of this book. And I'd like to begin by asking Mike, how did this all come about? What was the genesis for putting this book together in the manner that it was done? Uh, Well, in 2008, uh, we started the Council on Dispensational Hermeneutics. Uh, And that was started out of a debate that I had in 2007 with Prince Sandy at San Diego at, at the ETS meeting. Uh, uh, on an update of his book, uh, Plowshares and Pruning Hooks. And I came away from that debate thinking we had no place where traditional dispensationalists can talk to each other. We go to these other meetings where we're mixed with other people, but we have no place to hammer out things together. So we started the council to give a place for traditional dispensationalists to talk together about various issues. And our second year, uh, I picked the New Covenant as our topic because that seems to be the area where traditional dispensationalists disagree the most among each other. Not that we don't disagree on other things, but that seems to be a major one. And so we decided to do that. And of course, one of our goals was that our meetings would produce books and or articles and other things. And so we did have a book that emerged from this. And we have the three views that you mentioned. Uh, the two new covenants view, nobody uh, spoke up at the conference representing the two new covenants view. Uh, and so it was not included in the book. That was Chaper's so, view. Yeah, so that's where that's where the book comes from. Um, 
there's so there's no consensus on the, what the new covenants application is. Um, and that brought about this book. Why are dispensationalists so cloudy about this? Why isn't there, why isn't there a consensus? Well, I think the issue is, uh, first, we all want to protect the promises to Israel. Jeremiah mm -hmm. 31, it's written to Israel, and all the three views accept that. And there's a future fulfillment of that that's coming when Jesus returns. Then on the other hand, there's the New Testament passages, the Lord's Supper passages, 2 Corinthians mm -hmm. 3, the Hebrews passages, etc., uh, that talk about the new covenant and seem to relate it to the church. There are various debates about the details of those um, passages. And so how do we how do we describe what's going on there and still maintain the promise to Israel? And I think that's the concern. And I think sometimes there's too much concern for protecting the promise to Israel. I mean, there's no question what the exegesis of Jeremiah 31 is. Mm -hmm. so, but how do we say those things? Some people like Fulfillment language. For example, uh, the New Schofield Reference Bible uses fulfillment language and says the church fulfills the new covenant blessings to Israel. Now, that's, mm -hmm. that was, I think most of us today, most of us in the traditional camp would not like that uh, mm -hmm. because we want to protect the promise to Israel. The church isn't fulfilling it. Even those of us who hold that there is a new covenant uh, somehow apply it to the church and it's whether it's the one in Jeremiah 31 or something else, uh, it's not the fulfillment of the promise to Israel in any shape or form. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, complicates the issues. Uh, and it may be a discussion, uh, and I, I find this uh, problematic sometimes, uh, things arise in, with difficulty when, when it's a labeling issue more than a substantive issue. Mm -hmm. Because I came away... Uh, from the uh, counsel that we had and then the writing of the book and all that, I came away believing that the issue was not like this between us. It was more like this. We were all very close together. We all described the Christian life the same way, forgiveness of sins, the presence of the Spirit, the divine enablement for obedience. We, you know, we see all of that in the Christian life exactly the same. Uh, but we, how do we label that? So and that's part of the question uh, that's going on here. And also the other side is we want to be careful not to invoke progressive dispensational thinking that might get us off the rails. So there are a lot of concerns floating around in there. And I think that causes some of the cloudiness and why there's no consensus. Uh, mm -hmm. on, you know, the covenant guys have a consensus because they just blow away Jeremiah 31. If they had Jeremiah 31, they would have the same problem with consensus. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going back to like, I went to Word of Life last year and you go through all the covenants, right? You had the Abrahamic covenant made to Israel, made to Abraham. Um, and you had, you had no covenant before then, but that was before. And then you move on to the Mosaic covenant and then you move on to the Davidic covenant, all made with Israel. And then you get to the new covenant, right? Um, Jeremiah 30, 30, 31, 31. Would you say that Jeremiah 31, 31, is that still applicable to the new covenant? Is that still like the, that's the verse for the new covenant covenant? Or would you say it's, there's a different understanding of it today? Well, that is the new covenant passage. Okay. It was given. It's the first use of it. It's the only Old Testament use of that term. Mm -hmm. There may be a couple other passages that use like eternal covenant or something that may be talking about the same covenant thing. Peace. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but the new, but the new covenant uh, given to Israel is very clear. It's given to the house of Israel, house of Judah. And it's going to be fulfilled, I believe, at the second coming. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's it. You read the text. That's the plain meaning. Uh, there's no insertion of something else. Exegetically, that's it. Okay, now we come to New Testament passages, and we have exegesis about new covenant issues relative to church. And the, okay, is it, are we legal parties? Are we a legal partner? Are we uh, just seeing an application, et cetera? Uh, most of the views uh, that are in our book, the, the views don't like the idea that the church is a legal partner of the covenant. Mm. What we like to talk about is applicational language. That the uh, At least there's one that has no application. Okay, they're, they're trying to really protect the promise of Israel fully. 
But then you have two of the, the views are application to the church with nuances of difference, one through union with Christ, one that's not necessary. Um, and their goal is just an application. God sovereignly has decided that the spiritual blessings of the new covenant are going to be applied to the church today. And that 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 has nothing to do with us being legal partners to the covenant. It's just a sovereign choice of God. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we have some basis for that in the earlier covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, mm -hmm. because there is a feature in the Abrahamic covenant that is a spiritual blessing uh, on the other nations of the world, not just Israel. So the land promises of the Abrahamic covenant are not for the world, but the spiritual blessings are. And I'll mm -hmm. make you a blessing on all the nations. Uh, that's And the new covenant's one way that's done. It's through Christ that that is done. So uh, we can have that, and that doesn't seem to uh, make a problem with exegesis of the Jeremiah 31 passage, in my opinion. I think the guys who don't see any application of the New Covenant, they would struggle there. They say any kind of application of the church destroys our exegesis of, ex of uh, Jeremiah 31. And I don't think we need to go all the way to that that uh, extent. Yeah. Uh, do you know the name uh, Chris Cohn? Oh, yeah. He's a good friend. Good friend? Okay, he's cool, he's cool. on the steering committee of the Council on Dispensational Hermeneutics. Okay. And they wrote a, a book themselves coming out of that same meeting. It was mm -hmm. all written by those who hold to no new covenant for the church. Yeah. Yeah. He made that a big focus of one of his classes and, a, and it kind of provoked my thinking about it. Like, do I actually believe that? What do I think about that? Yeah. Um, and then you see this book, which is just like, boom, <laughs> all the information. So I uh, appreciate you doing that. But yeah, well, and I appreciate Chris's position. Uh, mm -hmm. Roy Beecham did a wonderful job in the book as the book for that view. In fact, at the 2009 council meeting when they were having given their papers i was listening to roy and i said you know i don't hold his position but he's given me some things to think about and he's given me some passages that i had not included in my thinking in this debate yep. and so it was very very helpful discussion even if i haven't come to his uh position just uh using going back to some basics it's called the new covenant um uh, What's it referring to? If it's new, what's it referring to as old? Is it the Mosaic Covenant? And does that limit its application to Israel only? Or how do we get the blessings being applied to the church? Well, I've already hinted where I think the blessings yeah. come. They come from the yeah. sovereign choice of God uh, to do that. Now, some of the covenant guys argue that uh, new covenant means renewed covenant. And that is, it's a renewed old covenant. And uh, mm -hmm. there are no dispensationalists I know that go that direction. Uh, Hebrews 8 very clearly says at the end that the old covenant is passing away. And I, I tend to think, uh, you know, it's about to be obsolete. And I, I think uh, that probably is a reference to the soon destruction of the temple in 70 AD, mm -hmm. in which there'll be no sacrifices under the old economy. Uh, at all now christ has died already and i think there's a transition period between the dispensations as they rub up against each other and and i think that's referring to that and so the sacrifices are gone there's nothing that, that they can even look at visually that might make them think about the old economy and so you i can't, think the, uh, the old you can't put into practice the old the old testament mosaic law any longer because the temple's gone the priesthood's gone so something's got to come in its place something new yeah and but the new covenant uh which I believe was inaugurated, uh, not not inaugurated, that's not the best word, established mm -hmm. by Christ at the cross. That's the basis for it. It'll be inaugurated or started when Jesus comes back for Israel. But Is I think that it, different than ratified? Uh, not necessarily. I think ratified, you know, these words are all thrown out. Everybody's looking for the right word. Mm -hmm. Okay. Established or ratified is fine with me as mm -hmm. words. The implementation of it will happen at the second coming. Uh, so I think the cross is the basis for it. I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be the point of some of the Lordship, uh, the, excuse me, some of the uh, Lord's Supper passages uh, right. seem to indicate that. So uh, I have no trouble with that. And even the Hebrews 9 passage is pretty clear uh, about that as well.
So the new is it is something new that replaces the Mosaic covenant, but it's told in Jeremiah to be new for Israel. So it's not technically something new for us. Israel but and Judah. But the language is used to talk about something that's applied to the church. That's the way I uh, look at that. I never really tell in the book what my view is. Mm-hmm. You know, I let the, and one of the reasons for that, I want the debate guys. To, it's a mystery. Yeah. I want the debate guys <laughs> to put that out. I tend to side with Elliot Johnson more than mm-hmm. the others. Uh, but I'm, you know, all these guys, again, like I said, it's more like this, not like this. And, uh, and I think they all did a good job uh, with that, uh, especially too. in the discussion at the council meeting. It was a very lively discussion uh, and very, very helpful. Uh, yeah. I, I wish we had videoed that. We weren't videoing mm-hmm. the conference live streaming them at that time. You know, that really hadn't come in yet. That was 2009. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, history. I, I, I see people before kind of being aware of this, like I just assumed we'll talk about First, the cup of the covenant, right? Jesus says, this is, my, this is my cup. This is the new covenant. I took that as an equal sign, right? Jeremiah 31, new covenant equals this new covenant. Another equal sign I saw was Holy Spirit indwelt permanently. That's the new covenant in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 31. Oh, believers are indwelt for forever. Okay, then equal sign, right? The, ch- the church equals that. Um What's your response first to that Holy Spirit, right? If Holy, if the believers are indwelt forever with the Holy Spirit, does that mean they're a part of the new covenant? Like, how does that dilemma or that, um, how does, how do you explain that? Oh, well, I hinted earlier, uh, there are three parts, I, I think, to this. Uh, there is the, the presence of the Holy Spirit and his ministry in, in individual lives. Mm. There is forgiveness of sins. Uh, and then there is, uh, this divine enablement to obey. Those to me seem to be the three major parts of the experience of people, mm-hmm. believers under the new covenant, whether it's in the New Testament application of new covenant blessings, spiritual blessings, or whether it's the formal new covenant uh, made with Israel in Jeremiah 31, and which will be implemented when Jesus comes. And Israel will, will get that spirit We'll get that uh, divine enablement. Uh, we'll get uh, the forgiveness when Jesus comes. That will happen for them. Uh, you know, they'll see they'll see him. They'll mourn for him, and they'll turn to him and embrace him in faith, as we know in other scriptures. At the mm-hmm. second coming, at the end of the tribulation period, so that'll take place. And nobody in the traditional camp denies that for Israel, and mm-hmm. that's one thing we want to protect all the way through there. The issue is, okay, now, what, how's the church plug into that? And the church uh, plugs into that. I think it's God's sovereign choice to take the spiritual blessings that are on the new covenant, and uh, which is really a reflection of the Abrahamic covenant, and apply it to the church, church-age believers in this dispensation. That'd be both Jews and Gentiles who come to Christ in this dispensation. So you kind of a- answered the question I was going to ask about um, it's inaugurated at the cross or ratified at the cross, but the fulfillment completely comes in the millennial kingdom when is all Israel is saved. What but what does fulfilled mean? Does does the church fulfill some of those promises that are made in Jeremiah thirty one? Yeah. Well, I don't like the word fulfilled for that, mm-hmm. okay. and I don't know that there are texts in Hebrews or anywhere else that uh, lead me to fulfillment language for that. Like some. Okay. Even traditional dispensationalists have uh, done. It's a slippery word. Fulfilled, naturally in our minds, thinks of, okay, prediction, direct fulfillment. That is, whatever's predicted actually happens. Mm -hmm. So when I have used it's fulfilled at the second coming, I'm talking about exactly what's in Jeremiah 31 happens at the second coming for Israel. The promise is given, the fulfillment, it happens in uh, the second coming. What okay, about that, a double fulfillment, though? Yeah, I, I shy away from some double fulfillments. Mm-hmm. Uh, the language I like to see in the original you know, taste text of it of, being in the church and then the complete fulfillment in Israel. Yeah. Uh, see, I, I don't, if I avoid fulfillment language at all, then I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> uh, you see, I see an application like is made to the church. It's not a fulfillment, it's an mm-hmm. application. So there's no sense in which the church 
in my view, fulfills the Jeremiah 31 passage. Mm -hmm. The spiritual blessings of it are applied to the church. That's I think that's the best way to say it. And it's the sovereign choice of God to do that. And it could be uh, tying to some other possible things that Paul taught. It's it's really part of uh, God using the Gentiles to bring uh, to bring jealousy to Israel when they see a glimpse of what they're going to get. Mm -hmm. If they pay attention to that, they may not, some of them, but some of them may as they think through some of the details. Is this sort of like the dog eating the scraps that fall from the master's table kind of type thing? We get the blessings from Israel, but there wasn't really meant for us. Is that the kind of type thing? Well, we want we want to be careful because God from the beginning knew he was going to use it for us, mm -hmm. some of mm -hmm. it, if, if I'm right about my view. Uh, but um, uh, it's designed for Israel, mm -hmm. but God also decided that he was going to take the spiritual blessings of it. Because remember, the Jeremiah 31 passage, in context, they get those spiritual blessings in their land. See, that we don't have that mm -hmm. context. No. We can't take the land context of Jeremiah 31. And even it's later, the that sticky passage, wicket to keep these and, two yeah, separate. And a little bit later, the Davidic covenants brought up. Uh, so none of that applies to us, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Uh, but the spiritual blessings uh, can be applied to us, and so it's an application question. I, I would I prefer to avoid fulfillment language. Now, if someone uh, uses it, and I, I've had a lunch recently with someone who likes fulfillment language. As long as it's, sometimes we use different labels, but we mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. And and I, I try to debate people based upon substance, not labels. Because mm -hmm. someone like how you do theology, you know, all these steps in doing theology, you may label it with different words, all the steps, but you're doing the same stuff. And uh, we argue about labels. And so I we want to be careful. I do know, and I joke sometimes that half of theology is defining things and the other half is arguing mm -hmm. and so we you know we've got to be careful about labels and we label things for a reason uh but i don't want the labels to be the centerpiece of our arguing yeah yeah elliot johnson brings up the question of yes we as christians receive some of the benefits but it's kind of like a contract nowadays like you make an agreement with a bank a mortgage or whatever like only those written into the contract receive what's agreed to um how can we as christians or how can believers or how can the church receive the blessings if they're not in the covenant um is that a faulty argument or yeah i think it is a faulty argument uh and i think i think roy beecham was making that mm -hmm. uh, that argument mm -hmm. uh, from his view i don't like the word contract for the new covenant see i don't mm -hmm. see the new covenant as a contract it, that legal it, contract it, the word contract to me mm -hmm. makes it bilateral mm -hmm. and i i you know, if i were to give a synonym for the word covenant it would be arrangement not agreement uh, but a lot of guys it's agreement mm -hmm. no it's arrangement and there are two kinds of arrangements covenantally in the bible there are bilateral covenants which you can call a contract uh, or an agreement but the, you know the two parties making agreement but then there's the the overwhelming you know, abrahamic davidic new covenants i think are unconditional unilateral covenants that are a promise mm. so they're promissory they are not bilateral contracts and so i don't like taking the new covenant and even using the word contract for it. so are you in favor of using the ancient near east practices in a manner to explain these covenants or do you want to shy away well, from that? Well, the problem is, okay, you know, if, if ancient Near Eastern literature, mm -hmm. uh, if you had all the books for that, all the writings for that, it would fill up your office so there would be no more airspace <laughs> for you, okay? Uh, and there are many strands within ancient Near Eastern literature. It's true. And what happens in our day, and it's fashionable, and I'm, I'm glad for it. I'm glad that... Uh, the scholarly world has gotten into ancient Near Eastern literature. Uh, some good things that have come from that, especially, you know, Second Temple literature is part of that. Uh, and uh, one good thing, for example, is that Paul is now a Jew. You know, 150 years ago, a scholarship thought he was a Gentile. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but now he's fully Jewish. Okay, But now, I think we're, the pendulum has swung too far the other way. 
And now we're letting ancient Near Eastern literature tell us what the Bible says. Mm. And I, you know, and I ask a different question, you know, well, the Bible influenced ancient Near Eastern literature also. It's not just a one way street. And so what people do, they reach in out and they grab what they like in ancient Near Eastern literature and they bring it in and say, this is the way the Bible is. Uh, but there, there are all kinds of uh, articles and, and statements out in ancient Near Eastern who make all contract, all, all covenants or contracts, but then there are others that say, no, it's this and that. The promise that I shared with you, the promise of unilateral versus the bilateral, uh, there's evidence in ancient Near Eastern for that. So which strand of teaching in ancient Near Eastern literature do you grab and come in and use as your model for what the Bible says? And of course, we always want the text of the Bible uh, to be this deciding factor. But yes, there are historical backgrounds. We have to take those into account. But I want to uh, be careful that we don't overdose on ancient Near Eastern literature. We're doing it in all sorts of things. We're using ancient Near Eastern literature to destroy Genesis 1. We're using it to define for us the nature of God. I mean, the, why not just stick to the Bible? I mean, the Bible... Uh, in Genesis 1, for example, I think there's a polemic against ancient Near Eastern literature. I think there's a polemic in the Bible about the nature of God that's different than the gods of ancient Near Eastern literature. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are differences, and we need to let the Bible speak on its own. And so uh, I want to be careful. It's it's good. you got to use it as background, but you don't preach the background. You preach the Word of God. And so uh, that's that's my statement about that. In chapter 1, I think it was Fredrickson, he tried to isolate the New Covenant passages throughout the Old Testament and the New. And he went through a, a, a survey of the works of Kaiser, Compton, Master, Pettigrew, and is it Buse, the French yeah. gentleman? Their models were intended, uh, when they wrote them, to surface all of these texts that related to the New Covenant and Scripture. There were many texts to deal with. But on page 59, Jeremiah 31 is said to be the central passage, which is what I was taught in Dallas Seminary and at Moody Bible Institute. As a pastor, I found that the more detail I get in hopping around, hopping around passages, the more confused people in the teaching. Isn't it better just to remain in one book and teach the new covenant, maybe from just Jeremiah, the Jeremiah passage, then going all over the place. And, and I know there's a place for that, especially in scholarship, but to the sheep in uh, the pew, isn't, isn't that less yeah. confusing? Well, uh, I certainly, you know, as a pastor, I was overwhelmingly an expository preacher. So mm -hmm. I was preaching through books. I didn't do that right. always, but there does come a place when you have to topically deal with things like the new mm -hmm. covenant, because when you or you could say you're doing a, a series through Jeremiah, mm -hmm. and you come to Jeremiah 31. As you as you, people are leaving the church, they're going to ask you about Hebrews 8 through 10. They're going to ask you about the Lord's Supper passages. They're going to ask you about mm -hmm. these other passages and what the relationship is. So you're going to have to be able you know, to have studied it and uh, be able to have an answer. Um, they specifically would ask you questions about the Lord's table. I've never had anybody ask me a question about the New Covenant. In 35 years of ministry, it's just never came up from from a lay person. Yeah. So that th that makes me weary of how much you want to go into it in a in a sermon, um, especially when you're out of an ex you know exegetical going through a book. Yeah. Um, if I was doing Jeremiah 31, mm -hmm. I was just going through an expository in Jer Jeremiah. I don't think I would bring up the New Testament passages. I might just allude to them to let the audience mm -hmm. know, my church know, that I am aware of those other passages, uh, but but those are about something else. This is about Israel and Israel's future, and I would mm -hmm. stick to that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'd probably do a little sidebar, you know, and I deal with that in other situations like a Sunday school class or something like that. Uh, I think you wrote the overview, if I'm correct, on dispensational history. And I, I found the, that I, I wrote the dispensational history article. Yes. Yeah, that was very helpful. The one thing I wanted to ask you about was the survey begins with Darby, and now the question is: Were there any dispensationalists before the eighteen hundreds, and did they have any writings about the new covenant, or were there none, or what they wrote was not helpful? 
Well, first of all, I only had so many pages. Okay. Okay. So I had to limit at the very beginning. I had to limit mm -hmm. and make some decisions. So I that's one of the accusations always thrown at dispensationalists. Sure. You are a new, you're mm -hmm. a new theologist. Come up in the 1800s. Yeah. Well, what I tell the covenant guys, that's what the Roman Catholics say about you. <laughs> that's true. You, know, you guys, Johnny, come lately. You started in the 1500s with mm -hmm. Calvin. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Catholics say we got 1500 years start on you. Mm -hmm. uh, so how how do they deal with that? They got their own problem. So, uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, William Watson wrote his book on dispensationalism before Darby. It's a very good book, mm -hmm. history book, uh, taking the English writings of the 1600s and 1700s. And there are there are probably now at least 20 pre-trib rapture statements in history we know before Darby. We have one in the 1300s. We have one going back maybe in the late 300s. Where we have a clear mm -hmm. pre-trib rapture. Some say the Epistle of Barnabas in the second century might be, have a pre-trib reference. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not quite as clear as I would like. Okay, so uh, and we have everything that it's in dispensationalism as a system. It can be found to one degree or another in the second century writing of Irenaeus, except for the pre-trib rapture. Uh, so, but the system or the the outline is is there. It's not quite like we do it, but it's there. And I start with Darby. He's, you know, again, I'm limited in space for the article. And I wanted to deal with the modern dispensational movement. And to talk about the modern dispensational movement, I think the starting point is Darby for that. He I systematized see. it for modern times. Mm -hmm. And that's the best way to say it. And the way we answer people and say that, you know, uh, it started with him. No, it was systematized by him. In the same way, they're going to say that the Westminster Confession systematized Calvin and Calvin systematized what went before. They're going to argue the same way. So they need to let us be able to say the same thing. Mm. Yeah. Not my observation, uh, my grandpa's observation reading the book, but um, progressive revelation um, doesn't seem to be a huge topic discussed in the book. Um, what are your thoughts on the progressive revelation when it comes to the new covenant, right? Um Israel, we have had a different view, or people reading the Bible had a different view reading Jeremiah 31 when it was written versus reading it with all of the New Testament, um, okay. with all their passages. Well, I, I think it is in the in, in the book, although it's just not named in the book. Okay. When all the different guys insist that the Jeremiah 31 passage in its own context uh, means exactly what it says. Mm -hmm. How did the original audience take it? It was about Israel and Judah. That's the promise. Okay, that's that's requiring progress of revelation as an input to interpretation. Now, when we say we believe in literal interpretation, we mean grammatical historical. Well, progress of revelation is just the historical part of that. It was written at a certain time. Jeremiah is written, you know, just there in the early days of the Babylonian captivity. All right, so Jeremiah has a time frame when that's written, uh, and it's for them. So all the writers insist on that. And so in, they don't use the word, but they're uh, they're following the progress of Revelation and its significance for Bible interpretation. Uh, covenant guys don't do that. For example, uh, Bruce Walkie would suggest that you can't understand a single verse in the Bible until you've read the whole Bible. And that's obviously not. Now, what does that say about the original audience? Yeah. Uh, I once gave a paper in a class, a PhD class at Dallas Seminary. I had about eight students in the in the class, and uh, when I and during the Q and A after my paper in the class, there were three covenant guys in the class. And I think a couple of progressives, and the rest were traditionalists. And and the uh, covenant guys got angry with me. I mean, visibly angry with me when I made this statement. I said, "You could have written." a systematic theology book in 75 BC. In other words, as new revelation comes along, you keep building and you yeah. gradually add to it and you, and you systematize it and you have something. They got angry with me when I said that. Now, later on, when the New Testament comes, I'm, all, I'm going to continue to add and continue my systematization process. But they couldn't abide that because the New Testament is their starting point. Mm -hmm. See, and that's the difference. Dispensationalists start in the Old Testament, follow the progress of Revelation. They do not. Mm -hmm. So they were visibly angry with me. And I learned something that day uh, about that. Uh, 
And so uh, we we do believe in the progress of revelation. It wasn't uh, voiced by name, but it, it is in the book. Yeah, I guess we can't write a systematic theology book until Jesus returns, right? <laughs> we don't have enough information yet. Yeah. But. Well, uh, if we uh, if he let us write one after that, we'd certainly have a, a fuller understanding mm -hmm. of everything. Yeah, very true. So, and we could go to the original author of the text and ask him. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that day. <laughs> yeah. Beecham argued that that the church has no part in the new covenant. He mentions four misconceptions about the new covenant. These misconceptions are about the nature of the new covenant, the purpose of the new covenant, the extent of the new covenant, and the chronology of the new covenant. Do you, did you think that these are valid misconceptions? I, I don't, I wouldn't word it the way he did on mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, he's just describing the exegesis of Jeremiah 31 and throwing in uh, a couple of chapters from Ezekiel. Okay. Uh, though Those are clearly Old Testament exegetical facts. That's what they are. But the guys on the other side in the debate, they wouldn't disagree with him over those exegetical points. Okay. But I think what he's assuming is we can't ever have a new covenant applied in a different setting than these things. Mm -hmm. Well, if God chooses to do so, he can. And so the question is, do the other New Testament passages indicate that God has done that, uh, made those choices? Uh, so I, I wouldn't call them misconceptions. Um, he can certainly, you know, here are the truths about the new covenant in Jeremiah. And I think he'd be fair to say, and I think he would be right to say, uh, the church in no way fulfills those things. But the other two guys in the book don't say that the church fulfills those things. None of the three guys say the church fulfills those right. things. Uh, so he's kind of arguing to another. He's kind of arguing to another guy out there instead of the two guys in the book. The same man, Beecham, relies heavily on on the understanding of the ancient Near East use of covenants. And he says that they should inform our hermeneutical and theological systems. Is the new covenant primarily a legal instrument? Yeah, I think you've already spoken to this a little bit, but could you go into that a little bit more? As yeah. he suggests, why is he wrong if he well, is? Again, in ancient Near Eastern literature, there are all kinds of statements about this and that and the other. Uh, and there are scholars, Moshe Weinfield, for one, Jewish scholar, I uh, wrote an article in the 70s uh, saying that ancient Near Eastern literature had two kinds of covenants, the bilateral and the unilateral. The unilateral were promissory, one-party covenants, like Jeremiah, excuse me, like Genesis Abraham. 15. Uh, mm -hmm. God, you know, Abraham was asleep. He wasn't mm -hmm. a party to the covenant. Right. A, uh, God made it by himself unilaterally as a promise. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's talked about uh, in, as a promissory covenant, not a contract. It's a promise. Mm -hmm. Now you say, okay, well, promises can be made as contracts. Well, I don't. Again, I don't like the word contract because it kind of stirs up the idea of a bilateral covenant. So I kind of stay away from it. A contract that both people sign or agree to. Abraham never agreed to that. It was just dumped on him. Uh, yeah, and, I always heard it referred to as a one-way covenant. It's a one-way covenant. Mm -hmm. And uh, in ancient Near Eastern literature is broad enough to encompass that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. again, I go back, okay, which strand of ancient Near Eastern literature do you take? You can often dip into that kind of literature and just pull out anything to yes. support whatever view you have. Yeah, and so you true. always have to double-check yourself. And and I'm not sure I pull out the same stuff that uh, Roy does. But Roy is mm -hmm. very good Old Testament scholar. I would never dispute that. No, I thought so too. Yeah. Yeah. If in the Old Testament, this is kind of just me thinking, if in the Old Testament we have no mention of the church, right? Church isn't revealed till later, till Ephesians. Which side is that more support for? Because um, if the only mention is of Israel in the Old Testament, New Covenant texts, and the church is a mystery concealed in the Old Testament, how could the Old Testament ever indicate or prophesy that the New Covenant would? have a relationship with the church. I could see both sides taking that argument, right? Um, well, 
the church wasn't mentioned, so the New Testament clarifies that versus um well the Old Testament doesn't mention the church, so the church isn't involved in any way. Yeah. Well, I go back again. What does the Jeremiah 31 text say? The church isn't there. Mm. Uh, there is no prediction about the church's involvement with the new covenant anywhere in the Old Testament. I think all three of the uh, debate authors in the book would agree with that statement. Mm. Uh, the issue is, okay, now we have these New Testament passages, advanced revelation, more revelation God gives about something else he decided. That is to take those spiritual blessings of the new covenant and apply them to the church in this mm. age. That's just a, a new thing that God decided and he told us about. Um, that is not saying in any shape or form, but that's what the Jeremiah 31 passage is talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. It, it's not changing. We should never change the meaning of the original text with the exactly. original author meant. Exactly. But we can, we can interpret it. Yeah. We interpret it from a different Yeah, I don't see the reference uh, being changed. Yeah. You know, the, the word church is not in Jeremiah 31, and uh, that's, we just follow the text. Yep. The new covenant is mentioned prominently within the Lord's Supper. It's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 11, and it is the basis of the argument, or a large part of the argument of Hebrews 7 through 10, in which Christ is superior to all of that that came before, the Mosaic covenant and all that. All things Israel. And then in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul uses the superiority of the new covenant ministry that he possesses versus the legalistic um, ministry that came before at the temple and so on. So how are we to understand, how are we to explain the difference between the new covenant for Old Testament and New Testament believers? Well, Again, we have to go back to what the text says. There are three pieces to that in terms okay. of how it actually looks in life. Mm -hmm. The presence of the Holy Spirit, okay, forgiveness of sins, and divine yes. enablement for obedience. Okay, And when you see how that's worked out in the New Testament, you can see that even in passages that don't talk about the New Covenant. For example, Romans 6, 7, and 8. In chapter 8, that's a lot about the Holy Spirit. And you can see those elements in other passages, Galatians 5, that don't even bring up the New Covenant, but just talk about the Christian life. Those elements so, kind of mirror what the Jeremiah passage predicts for Israel. So okay. those elements were not present for Old Testament believers, or were they diminished, or were they I think they're form? greatly diminished, under the, obviously under the law of the, of the Old Covenant. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the divine enablement and the presence of the Spirit. I don't believe that the Old Testament saints were um, permanently indwelt by the Spirit. I know there's a debate about that. Um, I see a dispensational change in the upper room discourse relative to those things. Uh, the, those passages are debated among traditional dispensationalists. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, I guess, a limited one because the Spirit did come upon people. Right, uh, but not necessarily stay with them forever. Right, and David prays, you know, take not your spirit from me. Well, right. he didn't have the indwelt, permanent presence of the Holy Spirit, so the spirit could be taken away from him. So we want to be careful with that and take each passage and look at it in its own context. And in uh, Romans eight nine, Paul says to the Christians, "If you don't have the Spirit, you don't have Christ." So in the Old Testament. Believers weren't indwelt. The Spirit would come upon them and enable them for specific ministries and tasks that the Lord was calling them to. Yes. Now in the New Testament, believers are indwelt. The Holy Spirit lives inside of them. This is basic stuff. I get it. But why do we continue to sin just like the Old Testament believers? Why isn't there a higher level of uh, incarnation of Christ in our lives? Yeah. Well, there is a higher level of potential for obedience. The, the, the divine enablement we have is greater than the divine enablement they had in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, because we have a spiritual dynamic within us that allows us to do better. No, but God is, he's not like a demon. A demon gets inside of a person and is very coercive. 
when God gets inside a person and he uses persuasion, mm -hmm. no coercion, most of the time. You know, I wouldn't put it past God. There might be an, a single event when she might coerce because of a purpose. But generally speaking, the Jonah. Holy Spirit doesn't seem to act that way uh, in the New Testament, in believers. Right. Paul treats it as it's there. You know, we're walking in the Spirit because we have the Spirit. And he kind of tells the Corinthians, you know, this. some of you used to be this. So don't do that now. Don't look like what you used to be. So mm -hmm. we, have the, uh, we have the opportunity to live like we were in the old life. So we can rebel and quench the spirit, uh, to use another phrase from Ephesians, okay, quench the spirit mm -hmm. uh, if we choose to. Uh, so but there's, there, but that doesn't mean the fact that we can rebel does not mean there's no greater ability that God has given us for divine enablement. So this indwelling of the Holy Spirit which is a promise of the new covenant does not have anything to do with soteriological purposes. It has to do with purely the coming of the spirit in the Eshkelon. And when Israel, all Israel turns to God, is, is that the point that it's making? Yeah. I don't think it's a point of individual redemption. Now in the new mm -hmm. Testament mm -hmm. economy, they coincide the presence of salvation and the presence of the spirit coincide mm -hmm. in the church age dispensation. But there's no cause and effect of those two things. Mm. I don't see the Holy Spirit's regeneration, for example. You know, there's a big debate: are were the Old Testament saints regenerated? That is, were they given new life? Forgiveness and new life are not exactly the same thing. So, it's kind of like Lewis Berry Chafer said: when a person gets saved today, there are like 35 different things that happen, mm -hmm. and he walks you through those 35 things. Um, and sometimes we just conflate all of those and make them all the same. Yeah. Uh, and I think we need to be careful and not just assume cause and effect through all of those. Do you and agree with we can, I'm sorry, Gabe. No, I was gonna, that was a point we can focus on and really praise God for. It's just like all that has happened with salvation. It's not just forgiveness. God, God's not a stingy God. Like he could have just done the basics for salvation, right? You get to come into eternity. No, he created us new he gave us the holy spirit regenerated us um the list goes on 35 different things like how great is god for doing that for us and i think that's one reason i love theology is because you learn more and more about god and what he's done and that we can praise him more and more because of that okay. elliot johnson argues that hebrews 9 15 through 17 is the key text in understanding the relationship between the new covenant in the church he argues that the new covenant is the, like the last will and testament of jesus as he died in the cross we receive the benefits of the new covenant because his last will and testament is guaranteeing or giving us those blessings for believing in the gospel he also points out that jesus is the high priest according to the order of melchizedek rather than the uh, levitical priesthood so do you have any comments on it? Do you agree with that? What, what, where's your, what is your position? I think, I think there's room to discuss it, mm -hmm. you know, especially verse 16 of Hebrews nine for where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. Right. Uh, and so he relates That's that back pretty to, powerful. Mm -hmm. relates it back to the death of Christ on the right. cross. But then there's the death of the animals in, a, in uh, Genesis 15. Uh, there's it's a little bit harder with the Mosaic Covenant and its establishment, uh, but there are sacrifices ongoing uh, that are related there. Uh, the Davidic Covenant is a little harder to see the death there. So, the, you know, mm -hmm. it may be better just to take those covenants and talk about those in a promissory way. The illustration he's using here is a different one in the culture of the time. Uh, about a, a, And that's where I think Eliot's coming from. Uh, when you talk about, uh, he, he kind of looks at a last will and testament. That's mm -hmm. one of the possible meanings of that word covenant. It's not the only possible meaning, but I think it's one of those. Uh, and in the context for where a covenant is, there must be a necessity to be the death of the one who made it. Right. Okay. In every covenant, we don't see death necessarily. So, um, so there's, I think there's room to discuss that there. But even apart from that, the idea that, this this uh, mediator, what he's done for us and our union with him uh, allows for this application to take place. 
And that was Darby's position. That's Elliot Johnson's position. And I don't know that it rises or falls on the last will and testament view. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, But, you know, I think it's clear there. And I I lean toward that view myself based upon this passage. Yeah, Uh, Decker looked at um, the new covenant through the Hebrew text only, uh, chapter 7 through 10. And he relies heavily on a textual variant found in verse uh, verse 8. Um, of chapter eight, the difference between a dative is a direct object and a dative is an indirect object, uh, pointing to two different Greek words. Most people's eyes would glaze over on hearing that. Do you think that is an important argument or is is he faulty using that? Well, Rod Decker was a very close personal friend of mine. He Mm -hmm. was on the faculty at Baptist Bible Seminary with me Mm -hmm. when I was there. And then later when I was dean, he was one of my faculty members. He was one of the best kept secrets in the country. He was one of the best Greek grammarians mm-hmm. in the country. And uh, I know where you're Greek. going with this. <laughs> okay, so I uh, I appreciate him very much. Mm-hmm. And um, and you know he it takes Greek grammarians to get excited about whether a dative is a direct object or an indirect right. indirect object. Okay. Those those kinds of issues do have a place in our interpretation. Mm-hmm. But as I read uh, chapters 7 to 10, I don't know that they differentiate or they clearly differentiate uh, between the two applicational views. See, the two applicational views are like this. They're really close together. Uh, but uh, but the, uh, because they had this distinction here, we had to make a distinction in the book. Uh, and so, uh, and that gave Elliot Johnson a, a place to write, and gave Rod Decker a place to write. And obviously, Roy Beecham's position was there as more distinct than the other two. So, um, you know, yeah, eyes glaze over. There's a place for it. Uh, I don't think it uh, solves the question. Most yeah. pastors would have no idea about that. The indirect or the direct object, Gabe. Yeah, um, this might be a very simple question, but <laughs> one I'm thinking about. Um, you have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament, the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. Um, is that based off of any way off of what we're talking about, like the two parts of the Bible? Um, why is there is there any correlation there? Yeah, uh, in my view, no. Uh, I okay. I don't like to use the word Old Testament as Old Covenant. Uh, I see the Old Covenant as a Mosaic Covenant, and the Old Testament has a lot more in it than the Mosaic Covenant. Yeah, yeah for sure. So I, I don't like to go that direction. I think it clouds things. Yeah. Uh, I think histo- we get that Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant labels on our Bibles and stuff. That's historical. Mm-hmm. But biblically, the Old Covenant is the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, and not the Old Testament as the, the parts of the Bible that are the Old Testament. Yeah, or so the, the call it the Tanakh. The Old Testament, uh, it's got to go all the way to Revelation, right? <laughs> Old Testament's all the way halfway to Revelation. Then you get to Revelation and then so oh, we got the New Covenant now, the New Testament. <laughs> yeah. I like Decker's um, critique of Beecham in which he used an illustration about the father's promise to take his son to the ball game. And that it that promise would not be voided if he brought a bunch of other kids along with him. So he states there that to overlook the nature and function of formal contracts. Is the new covenant a formal contract between parties? I think you've already answered that. Um, I think I have answered it in the negative there. It's not a yeah. formal contract. Yeah. It's a, How did you it's like that promise. illustration, though? Yeah, I like the illustration. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it helped to frame it. Um, uh, because the guys, you know, they want to say if there's application, then they're, whoever gets the application has to be a formal party to the covenant. Well, right. and I don't agree with that. You know, right. I go, who made up that rule? You know, what they're, what they're protecting though is a good thing. They're trying to protect the context and the exegesis of right. Jeremiah 31. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I agree with them on that. We all three agree on the exegesis of Jeremiah 31 and the application of it directly to Israel. The only question is now, how do we handle these other New Testament passages? And that's a different question altogether. Now, most theological works that are used in seminaries 
can be seen, I think, is almost humorless. Would you agree with that? There's not much humor in them. And yet there was when Beecham states that he told Decker he would never make him the ex, uh, ex executor of his will since Decker would not honor the will precisely as written, but would, ex would expand it to others is the idea of bringing other kids along. Um, he has in mind the church being included there in the new covenant promised blessings. Did What did you think of that? Yeah, well, it's an interesting one. Uh, it, there's a similar one with the covenant guys. You know, the covenant guys say to us, uh, you know, God made these promises to Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay, But if he if he gives like he makes a promise to Israel, I'm going to give you this land. But mm -hmm. then later he gives all believers the world. Did he keep his promise to Israel? And they want to say, yeah, he gave his promise to Israel. That's similar to Dr. Decker's uh, argument. Mm -hmm. And I and I say mm -hmm. not so fast because. At, he may give Israel the whole world, and he does, and he gives all believers the world, and he does, but in, there's a special way in which he gives Israel their land, or otherwise the promise is void. You know, I have never been given a promise to own any real estate in Palestine, what's called Palestine, mm -hmm. and I never will. Okay, that's for Jewish people. That's for the descendants through Isaac. Okay, so... Um, that has to be fulfilled. God can give them more than that. That's fine. But he can't give them less than that. Or he can't give them, uh, you know, give them Alabama instead. Okay with me. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, that's just not possible. So I understand Beecham's uh, argument mm -hmm. uh, to some point. But again, uh, our illustrations don't prove anything. They illustrate things. Yeah. That one was kind of humorous, though. It was. Yes. <laughs> It was. And Roy is a funny guy. I like him. Yeah. As we uh, wind down here, um, I had one other question. Um, what is the difference between covenant theology and the covenants of the Old Testament? I feel like covenant theologians kind of have like a monopoly <laughs> on any on the word covenant. But like we talk about it plenty. Yeah. And it's yeah I, and I was in conversation with someone else and I don't remember who it was, but. Uh, we were bemoaning the fact that we think they stole the word covenant when it really is should be our word. Mm -hmm. We should be called covenant theology because of our uh, grounding in the biblical covenants. Their covenants are not the biblical covenants. Their covenants are systematic categories. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the covenant of works in the garden, which Adam failed to uphold. So God instituted a new plan, the covenant of grace which is uh, individual elect individual redemption through election. And it covers all the biblical history after that. And it's very individualistic. It uh, doesn't really have any plan for nations such as Israel or other nations at all. It's all individualistic. Uh, and they, and there's also uh, some of them hold to a covenant of redemption, which is uh, an eternity past where the uh, persons of the Godhead made promises to each other. So and these are extra that. biblical yeah. covenants. They are systematic theology constructs right. that they have built, and, and they've built their entire theology around those constructs. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that's different than that's different than the biblical covenants, right. Abrahamic covenant, Davidic covenant, New covenant, etc. Uh, now, I think they've been beat up on that enough. If you read uh, "Introducing Covenant Theology" by Michael Horton, I don't think so. Let's do it some more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, if you, if you go read Introducing Covenant Theology by Michael Horton, he actually he tries to ground those systematic theology constructs in the biblical covenants. I think he makes an attempt at that. I don't think he succeeds mm -hmm. uh, at all. So, yeah, you're right. We can keep complaining about that. Yeah. Uh, so no I guess problem. But but I think that I think he saw the problem. Mm -hmm. He was honest about seeing the problem. Yep. Uh, they really are creedal. That's the main difference between them and us. Mm -hmm. We're not very creedal. We're not looking over our shoulder wondering if we're violating some creed. They're worried about breaking the Westminster Confession of Faith. Right. And they don't want to do that. So they're they're very much tied to a history mm -hmm. of theology, uh, mm -hmm. which I think probably causes them to miss things in the Bible. We're biblicists. Yeah. And we probably have some of that, too. I think everybody has a little of that. I think we have less of that than they do. 
Yeah. So I guess we've got to take back covenant theology. <laughs> we probably shouldn't call each other covenant theologians, right? <laughs> Not a good idea. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the horse has left the barn. I don't think we're going to get that one yeah. back in the barn. Yeah. I have the last question here. As I read through the text, Israel was referred to as Palestine several times. I don't know. This just doesn't sit right with me because Palestine was a name the Romans put on a region and not the land of Israel. It's also called the Levant. Are we going to start using that next? I mean, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, Palestine was a word that was hot and heavy in use back in uh, World War I when the British took over and the British mandate. Yes. And so I think it comes out of that and the theologians of the uh, 1950s were using it a lot, even dispensational ones, because that was common. You know, in 1940, you would refer to the Jews who live in Palestine as Jewish Palestinians. And mm -hmm. you would have referred to the uh, Arabs that lived in Palestine mm -hmm. as Arab Palestinians. And then you get to the 1960s and Yasser Arafat and the PLO turned it into uh, yes. intentionally into co a co-opted the word co-opted mm -hmm. the word for a ethnic people mm -hmm. group, mm -hmm. which really doesn't exist. Right. They're Arabs. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of us have changed now, and we use land covenant, for example, instead of Palestinian covenant. Mm -hmm. But some of the older dispensational books back then were using that because sure. that was the name of the land where Israel mm -hmm. uh, is going to come from. So I agree with you. I don't like that name, and I've, uh, I don't use no, Palestinian covenant anymore. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm just in the modern text. I think you should just say the land of Israel. Yeah, whatever. That's just me. Well, we want to thank you for meeting with us and for answering our questions, whether they were well written or not. You, um, you know, succumbed to our inquiries, but uh, we want to give you an opportunity to uh, advertise anything that you would like a book or a website or some upcoming project that you're working on. This is your time to share with people those things that they might be interested that uh, you're working on. Yeah. Well, I am still working on very slowly my a comment, exegetical commentary on the book of Revelation. Uh, I decided to publish it in three volumes, and uh, I'm not too far from getting the first volume out, be the first three chapters plus the introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, working on another a book for Tyndale Press on uh, basically how to do theology, prolegomena. Mm -hmm. It's part of a longer series on systematic theology done by traditional dispensationalists. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, appreciate your prayers for Friends of Israel. You know, as I, I'm the director, I'm the vice president of international ministry. So I oversee all of our international employees who are nationals throughout the world. And in Israel right now, we have uh, four or five of our workers have been called up into military service. And so they're on the front lines. They're our missionaries in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, uh, we're praying like I'll get out for them. And then uh, sure. a lot of people in their churches that are over there have been called up. So it's a very delicate and very fragile and disheartening time. But we need to pray for Israel with everything we can muster. Gabe, you want to do that? Close us in prayer? Yeah, again. Dear Heavenly Father, I, just, um, I thank you for um, saving us. I thank you that we are um, believers in what you've done for us, God. And I just thank you for your son, um, that he came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and rose again for our sins. And um, I just thank you that we have um, the blessings of that, Lord. Um, and whether we um, participate in some blessings of the new covenant and um, whatever relationship we have to that, Lord, I just thank you that um, we are blessed in that way to have the Holy Spirit and to um, um, to be saved. And I pray for Israel, Lord. I know um, lots going on over there, Lord. Um, I just pray first off for wisdom for the government, wisdom for the leaders there, knowing how to... Yes. Um, how to confront the Gaza Strip, how to confront the Hamas, Lord. I just pray that you give wisdom to the leaders. Pray for the missionaries that Friends of Israel has over there. Um, I just ask that as they're called up, um, keep them safe, Lord. I pray that they wouldn't, um, I just keep them safe, Lord, and I pray that they'd be a witness, Lord, amidst wherever there are, Lord, amidst the other Jews, Lord, a witness for Christ. Um, Jesus is the Messiah, Lord, and I pray that they'd share that. And I just, um, I just pray, um, Pray over the world, Lord. I just pray that your gospel would go out and people would come to know you. Um, 
pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Mike, thank, thank you, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Book Podcast. If you liked what you heard and want to support us, like, follow, subscribe on any podcasting platform, on YouTube, on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Simply type in at Hear the Book Pod, at Hear the Book Pod. Thank you. See you next time.